Good afternoon, everybody. And here we are again for our Friday webinar session with Women in Recruitment. And today we're joined by Yasmin Sheikh from Diversity Matters. Yasmin is a trainer and a coach in the area of disability and diversity. And I'm really grateful that she's joined us today to talk to us about a topic that I think our industry has yet to really tackle, both in terms of our understanding around disability within the workplace and also in the way we support and engage with our clients to help them be educated to, to put in solutions that are appropriate within their organisations. So I for one am really hoping I, I can learn a lot from you today Yasmin and I'm really thrilled that you've been able to join us. So I'll pass over to you and invite um, our attendees to send questions through on the chat box please and we'll be fielding those questions during the session as appropriate and also some at the end so please do send them through as you think of them. So Yasmin welcome and thank you again. Thank you Natasha thanks for that great introduction as well and it's absolute pleasure to be here today and as we said at the start if you do have questions bring them through I think Natasha is going to be asking interjecting so we can make this conversation so it's not just me talking at you but it's going to be um, in, informal and, and interesting for you and engaging so please do feed through your questions so um, I will tell you a little bit about me later but you're probably joining this webinar for all sorts of reasons it could be that Disability is an area where you're really awkward about, you don't want to get it wrong, um, maybe you're not sure of the language to use with a candidate, um, and also maybe you've got um, disabled people who are not declaring their disability, maybe they don't have a visible disability, so you don't even have a conversation with them about it. Or perhaps where you are at the moment is that you don't know what the law is, where it, where it comes to asking people asking candidates about their disability or health condition and so that causes a lot of awkwardness as well between you and the candidate and um, and it just means that it's uncomfortable for people and what i want to try and help you to do on this webinar is so that you have a bit more confidence and a bit more awareness and knowledge about this area of disability so that you can recruit from the widest talent pool which includes disabled talent because we often talk about diversity and unfortunately disability is usually the poor relation when it comes to diversity um, because we often don't think about it or we, we have misconceptions about what disability actually is. So I want you to enable, enable you to have you know, fresh, interesting, diverse candidates, including disabled candidates that you can put forward to your clients. And also hopefully in this webinar, which is just a taster, you can be clear and confident what you can and what you can't say as well to a candidate and so that you're more comfortable around this area of disability. So that's sort of an overview. Um, it's probably a good place to start to say, well, what is a disability? Because we have, may have misconceptions about what that is. So under the Equality Act of 2010, um, I will read out the definition. It is a physical or mental impairment which has a substantial and long-term adverse effect on your ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities. So, I mean, those def that definition is broken down in the Equality Act, but broadly speaking, it is both visible and non-visible disabilities. Long-term adverse effect is 12 months or longer, and it can include fluctuating conditions as well. So we're talking about things like cancer, diabetes, dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism, wheelchair user, physical disability, um, HIV. Uh, a lot of them are actually non-visible. In fact, you might not know that most disabilities, 97% of disabilities are actually non-visible. So I am a wheelchair user and we'll come to my story later. But it's a misconception to think of disability as just sticks and wheelchairs. Because I think people in their head, if I asked you right now, what words or images come to mind when I say the word disabled, you would probably have an image or a word, probably a negative word, if you're honest with yourself, about what people can't do. You would think about somebody not being able to do something, they're being disabled by their impairment. And if you even think about the word disabled, it starts with the negative prefix dis. So this is in our minds. And I think this is important about language because 
our thoughts affect our words, affect our actions and affect our behaviours. So it affects the way we think about people, the assumptions we make about people, the people we put forward to clients or don't put forward to clients, the conversations we have with them or don't have with them, how we think of them as a leader or not as a leader. So we can overlook a lot of talent by the language and the words, the imagery that comes into our heads. So I think that's an important part of it. And another statistic is that 86% of disabled people actually acquire their disability whilst of working age. So that's a huge number of people, 86%. Not people just born with a disability, but acquiring it during their lifetime while they're working. So it's a huge proportion of people we can't fail to ignore. Next bit is that I wanted to, to sort of say, well, why should we make the recruitment process more inclusive? My reason is, is that because at the moment we have a problem, there, you've probably heard the expression, talent is everywhere, opportunity is not. There are currently lots of barriers for disabled people. Um, the barriers may be attitudinal, cultural. You know, we talked about the language, the assumptions we make about disabled people. It may be um, the fact that it's environmental. I mean, I as a wheelchair user cannot physically get in all the buildings. So that those jobs are out for me because I can't physically get in. It may be uh, a barrier in terms of technology. If you're visually impaired, can you access the website? You know, can you even see the website? Does a video have subtitles if you're hearing impaired? These are some of the barriers that exist for people with different disabilities and health conditions. Um, and, and currently 1.3 million disabled people in the UK are excluded by inaccessible and badly designed e-recruitment websites, 1.3 million. That's a huge number of people. How many people are we missing out? All that talent is out there, but the opportunity is not. Also, I'm involved with the Law Society because I'm a, a lawyer by background, and there we, we did some research with Legally Disabled where they looked at um, the legal recruitment industry as well. And they interviewed um, solicitors, paralegals, people at different stages of the legal, their legal career. And they, there was quite a shocking statistic, actually, that only 9.7% of disabled solicitors and paralegals said they had a positive and supportive response when using legal recruitment agencies. So that's an overwhelming majority of people who, who you know, had a, not a good experience. They said what the problems were with the recruitment industry in the legal profession is there's a misunderstanding about disability. There's a lack of knowledge about disability. There's a lack of confidence about disability. And I, where I come from is I think that a lot of this is well-intentioned. It's just that people don't know. It's not that people are malicious or they're trying to screen people out. We all have blind spots and biases and sometimes we just have gaps in our knowledge. And the fact that you're here today listening to this webinar is a brilliant way to say, I wanna open my mind up. I wanna learn about this subject a bit more and understand it better. Um, also what the survey said is, is, is there's a real lack of knowledge about reasonable adjustments that are available to people. So reasonable adjustments are things that put disabled people on a level playing field. They can include flexible working, um, they can include um, ensuring that somebody has a taxi to work because a lot of the underground is inaccessible for me as a wheelchair user. So access to work, which is part of the government, actually provide funding. Again, a lot of people don't know about access to work, funding for people to um, enable them to travel to and from their workplace. So if you don't know that as an employer or a recruitment person, you may think, you know, how is this person going to do this or even get to this job or, or you know, have the skills for this if, if, if they don't have the adjustments in place. There's, so there's a, a lack of understanding about adjustments as well. Um, another reason to make recruitment more inclusive is the business case for having disabled, disabled talent is, is very apparent now. A lot of research has been done about this. So massive companies like JP Morgan, Google, um, they have got neurodiversity at work initiatives. So 
Neurodiverse people, if you're unsure, it's people generally on the autistic spectrum. And um, big companies like this have been recruiting autistic people um, and 10% of the UK population um, is neurodivergent. So it's, it's, a, it's a sizable amount of people um, because they realize they're not looking at their disability, they're looking at it in a positive way, they're looking at their ability. Autistic people generally tend to have great skills, when it, analytical skills, great attention to detail, um, doing methodical tasks. And it's been so successful, JP Morgan said that after three to six months working in the mortgage banking technology division, autistic workers were doing the work of people who took three years to ramp up and were 50% more productive. So it's not about, oh, we're just doing the right thing and letting disabled people work and, you know, being a good person and all that. This makes good business commercial sense. So if it, as a recruiter, if you are not doing this, you are A, missing out on talent, B, missing out on the fact putting forward really different, fresh candidates um, who are, um, you know, using their disability actually to showcase what they can do, not what they can't do. So I think that's quite an important um, piece. So, and I would also say that the, the time is right now to do this stuff, to get engaged with disability, because we're living at a time where, you know, it's, it's a global pandemic and we're all working very differently now. Most of us are working from home. There's more flexibility. Disabled people have said, suddenly the adjustments that I needed from work, whoa, they're available now. They weren't available before, but because we've had to adapt to this new way of working, this new normal, they've had to make the provision so they can work from home. There was pushback reluctance from employers before saying, this job can't be done at home. But they have proved that they can be productive, efficient and profitable um, for empl employers. So recruitment needs to be aware that we are working in a different time now. And you know, Twitter, you may have seen Twitter and some major law firms like Slater Gordon, uh, Norton Rose Fulbright, they have now conducted surveys, global surveys with their employees. And a lot of them are saying, we like this remote working. I mean, it may not be for everyone, but on the whole, a lot of people are saying, we love the flexibility. We like remote working. It's a smart way of working. And actually those companies have decided to permanently change their policy so that when we go back to a sense of normality, whenever that is, um, we will be able to work in this smart way and, and have more flexibility, which is good for disabled talent. Because usually what we're trying to do is fit disabled people into a one size fits all. And it doesn't always work like that. What disabled people tend to need is a more imaginative way of working, a different job design, a way of saying, I'm not working less efficiently, I'm just working differently to you. So this time that we're living in is very, very pertinent um, for particularly for, well, for, for, for women who bear the brunt of caring responsibilities, for disabled people who work differently, for all sorts of people who have different reasons for not doing the strict nine to five, this is quite a good time, I think, to live in. Jo, I'm, I, Natasha, I'm stopping there before I go into my story. Is there anything coming through or anything you'd like to say um, before I rabbit on? <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's no questions as of yet, so we'll just remind the audience, please do send any questions through. Um, but I, I'd just like to say, I think, I think a lot of what you've said in your intro there, Yasmin, is, is really pertinent, and particularly this piece around the opportunity that COVID's given us. Mm. Um, and, you know, you have to look at all these scenarios that, that become challenges in life and look at the good that's come out of them. And absolutely, I think out of this time, you know, we've had to really challenge some of those legacy ideas of thinking around how we work and, and what's possible. And I really hope that this, this time has done, as you said, created a platform for change for, for many people. And, and I've spoken to a lot of people who, you know, just like you, have been, they said they've been far more productive at home. And these are, these are people whose scenarios vary across all different levels, whether they've got a disability or not, I'm not entirely sure, but I can only imagine how now 
um, you know, we don't have an excuse anymore, as you said, to mm -hmm. say, well, we can't accommodate you here. So sorry, the job's not available. Um, and I also think what you said about um, looking at ability and not seeing, I think it's, you know, as you said, disability, it's such a negative connotation, isn't it? Yet when you again look at some of the um, strengths that come when you have a disability that almost compensate for the disability, yeah. there's so much to be had there. Um, and I remember reading once that, um, you know, I think um, a high, high percentage of very successful business people have been dyslexic. I think Richard yeah. Branson's big. Um, and again, with dyslexia, your brain compensates in other ways and, and it brings to the table skills that have proven now to, to make people more entrepreneurial and mm -hmm. successful in a certain way. And, yeah. and that's not always visible and obvious, is it? No. Um, and again, I, I'm sorry to labour this, but I think it's so important because you touched on the fact that we've got hidden talent we're not utilising. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's been something over the last few years that I felt quite strongly about is we don't see people for the whole of who they are often. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that there's a, a thinking coming through at the moment called the sort of opportunity marketplace in terms of talent. And that's looking at people, not just for the skills they've got for a job, but what opportunity they present with this other set of skills that they might have in their, in their pocket through mm -hmm life experiences through having to deal with a disability whatever it might be but seeing the whole person rather than just the person that comes in to do that particular job that you might want to be done so it's fascinating so thank you so, so you're going to tell us now how to, to go about doing this <laughs> well i'll tell you a little bit about me because i know people do like stories and um it's probably useful for people to know you know where i come into this why i'm so passionate about this so um, my story is this, is that I wasn't always a wheelchair user. Um, on the 18th of March 2008, my life completely changed overnight. I was 29 years old, working in the city as a lawyer. Uh, I went to the gym probably nearly every day, vegetarian, I've never smoked in my life. Just leading a normal life really, lived on my own, living, living it up, having a great time working in a, a busy litigation department personal injury at that as well. It's very ironic. And I basically went to bed one day, fit, healthy, um, you know, no issues. And within a matter of hours, I couldn't get out of bed at all. My legs just stopped working. There was no warning, no accident, no idea what had happened, uh, which was very scary at the time. And to cut a long story short, I ended up going to the hospital and my consultant a uh, neurologist said, you've had a spinal stroke. And I'd never heard of that before. I thought, what, what, you know, how, how can I have a spinal stroke at 29 years old? And, and it really felt like the rug had been pulled from beneath me because he said, you will have to, you know, rely on a wheelchair for the rest of your life. At that point, didn't know if I could walk again. But he said, you know, I think, you know, if you did walk again, it would be limited mobility but you'd still need to rely on a wheelchair and I can I mean it feels like I'm talking about a different person now because I've it's 12 years on I, you know I'm in a different place it's like if you go through a bereavement or a divorce it still hurts there's pain there but you reflect and look back differently because it's a cliche time can be a healer but you 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 aren't the same person when you're going through the fog of bereavement and it was like a bereavement it was like a loss for me I just didn't know anyone else who was disabled I, I had all these negative uh, preconceptions about you know will I ever work again will I marry can I have children I had so much going on in my head and it was all negative really because I, I was completely devastated because it was just like that so what happened was is that I went for rehabilitation and, and I always thought rehab was about learning to walk again, but it wasn't. It was Stanmore Hospital, the Royal Orthopaedic um, uh, Hospital, and I had to learn how to use my wheelchair now. So how, how I dress differently, how I wash, how I move around, you know, my whole body had changed. It wasn't just not, the, not walking, you know, lots of things happen when you have a spinal cord injury. And also it, it was about myself. It was about not just how other people looked at me now differently, but the relationship with myself 
And I, I remember looking in the mirror one time, seeing myself in a wheelchair, thinking, you're the first disabled person I've met. You know, I was making it up as I went along. I, I didn't know how to be disabled. I didn't know anything about it. So it was about that relationship and that identity and how I saw myself as, a, as now a visibly disabled person in the world. So I was in rehab for three months. And when I left rehab, that's when actually the work began. Because I noticed that once you get to grips with the physical aspect, you know, moving around differently, dealing with the inaccessible world, and that's a whole nother story, but it's the attitudinal barriers. People, for example, would say things like, do you work? Whereas before, when I was walking, they would say, what do you do? Hear the difference. What's the assumption there? And these assumptions, these messages that you get are on a daily basis. Um, very, very slight. Um, again, there are, again, well intentioned, but they display people's prejudice, assumptions and ignorance actually about what they say or sometimes what they don't say because I've been, my friend has been spoken to and I've been ignored. They've just assumed that that person's my carer. Or, and these messages, you, you, you can't help but internalize them. So this does have a, an effect on the way you show up at an interview or the way you show up with people. You've, I mean, I'm quite cocky, I have to be. You've almost got to overcompensate as a visibly disabled person because you've got to say, I'm here, I'm visible. So what happened was I went back to work probably after a year and I had a good boss, I had a bad boss. My bad boss said to me in an appraisal, and I had been only back for a very short period of time, he said, Yasmin, if I employed everyone with your disability, the business would collapse. He said, I've got the same problem with part-time women workers. If I employed all of them, the business would collapse too. Now, this was a guy who didn't quite get diversity. The fact that we all have different skills, we all have different talents, we all see things different. We can, I believe we can all bring something different, new, fresh. I bring something different to him. He brings something different to me. But collectively as a team, we can, we can really make the business successful. But he didn't, he wanted a homogenous group of people. He didn't quite understand that the, the benefits of diversity. But at that point, because my confidence was so low, I believed him. I, I believed him because I thought, well, I'm grateful now to have a job. I, I, what, what value do I actually bring? It took me a while to build up my confidence. Luckily, I also had a good boss and he was the global HR director. And he saw that I was passionate about diversity. I was blogging about unconscious bias, which is bias that we have. We don't even know we're making decisions, shortcut decisions without even fully processing what we're doing. And I was blogging about it and he asked me to set up a disability network at work. And from then on, I thought, you know what, I love this work so much. I started doing workshops, webinars, and then set up my business, Diverse Matters, five years ago. So that's, what, that's my story in a nutshell, that now what I do is webinars like this, workshops, um, training for people who want to get better, uh, educating themselves, equipping their staff with the knowledge about how to recruit and retain disabled talent. Wow, that's amazing. I have to say, you're very inspiring and, and all hats off to you because that must have been such a huge shock for you to, to have that thrown at you in a completely unprepared way. Um, and it's, you know, all, all credit to you, Yasmin, for taking what could have been, you know, a really life shattering experience and turning it into something to make the world a better place and, and use that knowledge to help others. So I, I, I'm sure I speak for much of the audience and just say how how you know fun, glad I am to see that you you've overcome what could have been a real setback and, and really made the most of it yeah I mean it's been it's you still have your challenges but you know it's um I'm trying to use what's happened is into something useful and constructive and good and you know I don't I, don't get me wrong I get days where you, you get you know angry and frustrated as you know that's just life it's just called you being a human being um, and I have to be honest about that but um, yeah I, I love what I do I absolutely love what I do so Great. thank you well, we've got no more questions at the moment but I'm hoping as as you 
start to to get to some of the things that you would like us to take away in terms of learns yeah start to, to ask some questions great so I, I i this this webinar i've split it into three parts now so we, when you join this webinar, you could see that the top takeaways, top tips that you would get. We're going to look at it in three parts. So one, how to challenge your thinking about disability. Two, how to talk about disability so you're more confident around the language, what you can and what you can't say as a recruiter. And three, how to make recruitment more inclusive. So I've got some tips for you there. So I will begin. So how to challenge your thinking about disability. Now, I asked you at the beginning, you know, what words or images do you conjure up when you think about disabled people? You know, think about that. And it may be negative uh, connotations. You may not have much experience with disability. You may not know anyone who's visibly disabled or, or you know, maybe this is new, this conversation, so you haven't really given it much thought. But I wanted to talk to you about the three models of disability to, so that you can understand how how, how we think about disability. So the first model is the medical model of disability. Now, what this model says is, is that disabled people are maybe ill, we perceive them as need, we need to fix disabled people, um, you know, there's something wrong with them in inverted commas. And what, how that plays out as recruiters or people in a workplace is that we are not seeing disabled people as talented, we're not seeing their ability. We're all we're seeing actually the negatives and actually thinking perhaps in our mind, this person's costly, this person's a burden. Um, I'm not sure how to accommodate this person because it's going to be too hard. That's what the medical model of thinking does. There's a misconception. People think that reasonable adjustments are very expensive. I can tell you now, the average cost for an individual um, for an adjustment is 75 pounds. So most people might think it's in the thousands or it's, it's 75 pounds, so it's a small amount. And most adjustments are free or inexpensive. So flexible working, later start times, a quiet room, headphones, things like that. These are adjustments that actually don't cost anything at all or they're very inexpensive. So that's the medical model. Now, the other model, and I'm going to talk about three models, the second model is the social model of disability. And what the social model does, it completely turns the medical model on its head. It says that what is actually disabling is not the disability itself, it's not the impairment, it's not the fact that I'm in a wheelchair, necessarily. What I'm disabled by, and dis other disabled people are disabled by, are the barriers created by society. So what are those barriers? Those barriers could be environmental. I can't physically get into a, um, a building if there's no ramp for me because I use a wheelchair. It could be technological. A visually impaired person um, or blind cannot access a website if it's inaccessible to them because of the technology. The barrier could be cultural or attitudinal. We assume the person can't do a job so we don't even have the conversation with them. It could be well-intentioned. It's something that I call misplaced paternalism, where we think that's going to be too hard for that person. They say they've got mental health issues and anxiety. They can't do this presentation. I can't put them in front of this client. It's going to be too much. They've just come back from cancer, recovering from cancer. I'm not sure they're quite ready. It's misplaced paternalism. Again, well-intentioned, but we haven't even had the conversation. We've written them off overlook them and actually we haven't even got to know what is the situation the barrier could be organizational so you know currently the recruitment process can be one size fits all but for example have you thought about this a lot of um, organizations are now getting rid of multiple choice testing for example online multiple choice testing as part of their recruitment process because for some people with autism, that just doesn't work. So could we have a, 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 a recruitment process which tests people for the skill, but in a different way? Why do we have to have a uniform way of testing people? Because that isn't creating a level playing field. Um, if we need to find out have they got the skill, what well, does it matter how we test people? So could it be an organizational um, barrier? 
So the social model says these are the barriers that are in place and this is how we remove them so that people's impairments aren't the issue. It's the barriers that need to be removed so that they have an equal opportunity to compete for those jobs. The third model is the charity model. Now the charity model says, you know, disabled people are unfortunate, we pity them, we feel sorry for them. Uh, how does that play out in the recruitment industry or, or in, in a workplace? Well, I always say there's, there's usually, if you have a visible disability or you declare your disability, what can sometimes go on is there's a soft bigotry of low expectation where people just say things like, do you work rather than what do you do? The assumption is you don't work. You know, there, and there's so many assumptions that people make about somebody once they declare they have a disability. So this is why people are quite reluctant to share it because they know that these misconceptions are placed in people's mind. And it comes from the charity model that we need to look after people, they need protecting, we feel sorry for them. Now, all of these models have a place in society because we need charities. We need doctors that help people be the best that, that they can be. And that could be through medical intervention, whatever. But what I'm saying is, is think about how this different ways of thinking can be in a negative way when it comes to your industry and the way that you recruit people or overlook people. That's, what, that's all I'm saying, they have a place, but how does it affect your thinking? So that's the first section and how to challenge your thinking about disability. Don't know if there are any questions on that section. That, well, there's some questions in general, Yasmin, and I'm wondering yeah. if they might be better, these ones to be held to the end, because they they're, they're, they're a bit more wide reaching. Okay. So no I'll probably hold them for a moment and ask yeah. you. Okay, I thought I'd check in rather than me going on. The second, the second section is how to talk about disability because you may be very nervous about what you can or can't ask a candidate, you know, and it's uncomfortable. And I understand that because this subject can be uncomfortable. Firstly, it is unlawful to ask any candidate about their health or disability prior to making a job offer. And that's according to the Equality Act. Where it is lawful is if that question directly relates to an intrinsic part of the job. Let me give you an example. So say somebody was going for a job as a driver, that, that is an intrinsic part of their job. But say their disability or health condition was that they had epilepsy, you know, and you have to be, I think, free from um, an episode for about a year in order to have a driving license. So if, if you had epilepsy and, and, and fits and, and um, ep episodes quite frequently, obviously that would mean that your health condition means that you could not be a driver and that's an intrinsic part of the job. So only in relation to that, it is lawful to ask that question, but otherwise it's totally irrelevant. Um, also, another reason it's lawful, if you're asking for the purpose of making a reasonable adjustment, that is pertinent as well because it's about the adjustment it's not about the disability you're not asking intrusive questions about how did you how why why are you in a wheelchair how did that happen it's completely irrelevant you're not asking medical details you just need to know what do you need um, because of your impairment disability health condition is there anything that you need so that you can have an adjustment in the interview process the recruitment process so that you're put on a level playing field, you can ask that question. Um, the questions need to focus on the key components needed for the job, not the disability. That's the point. Yes, I mean, what if you, um, you know, at what point would somebody maybe ask, are there any reasonable adjustments that you require? So when we think about disability, that's not so obvious. Yeah. Uh, would that, would you, be suggesting that that would happen at offer stage, for example? Yeah. Well, that's a brilliant question because that kind of goes on to the next section, like how to make recruitment more inclusive. Because my, I think best practices, and this is what a lot of, I know in the law, law firms are doing this, if, if they're very progressive when it comes to disability is, they don't, they, they ask all their candidates, what adjustments do you need in order to help you do this job better? 
And so what it does is it doesn't give special status or stigmatize disabled people per se. It asks everybody. And actually, maybe some people need flexibility for different reasons, caring responsibility. But what it does is it creates a culture whereby people are more comfortable saying, and, and, and as we've seen in this, in this global um, pandemic, we are fitting our lives around, you know, remote working. And sometimes it's worked well, sometimes it's not for people. But the point is, is that, you know, we all need different things. And so typically when they ask that question, it's right at the outset and it's to everybody. It's like asking all candidates, what adjustments do you need to help you do your job better or to help you perform better at interview or that can help you in this recruitment process? And good practice is also to give examples of what those adjustments are. Because a lot of the time, there's some people who've been made newly have a new diagnosis and they're not sure what they need. They're not sure what it involves. Um, there may be some disabled people, you know, who, who aren't sure, you know, what, what's the interview process about? How does it all work? So you can give examples. Well, these are some of the adjustments that we offer. Would that, would, do you think that would help? So it's having that conversation with everybody. Um, I said, so I think that, that's a great question. It's just asking at the outset so that removes any stigma. And also what you're also doing is you're, ask, you're opening the question and the dialogue, which shows you are a, a recruitment agency or a recruiter or an employer that is comfortable having this conversation. It creates the culture and the relationship from the word go, which is so good for for disabled people if they have any anxiety or um, trepidation about sort of talking about this because it's hard for someone to ask it should just be a standard you know rather than someone initiating a conversation then you're on the back foot so does that answer the question that, that's great it's very helpful thank you and i think it's all about creating that safe environment isn't it absolutely yeah yeah okay thank you that's great um, and then I would say another point about how to talk about disabilities, don't make assumptions. I mean, there's a, what's that expression? If you assume you make an ass out of you and me. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. And, and you know, some people will say, oh, my, my cousin's in a wheelchair. I know all about that. Well, guess what? I'm probably very different to your cousin because not everybody is the same as well. So just because you have a little knowledge of disability it doesn't make you an expert. What I've learned is that I am a disabled person and I'm still learning about disability. You don't need to actually know about the disability. It's irrelevant. You just need to know how could this impact the job? What do you need in order to, to perform these skills? You don't really need to be an expert in disability and you just need to listen to people and, and not assume and don't judge them just because based on some limited knowledge, oh, my cousin can do X, Y, and Z, they can't do that, therefore it's the same for you. It sounds like a silly point, but I've heard organizations say things like, oh, we, we, we had a blind employee and, and this is what he needed, assuming that that other person who has a visual impairment or is blind needs exactly the same thing. And it doesn't always work. You realize there's diversity within this very, very diverse group. So it's, it's it's an individual relationship that you have with the person. It may impact them very, very differently. So don't be scared of having that conversation about it. Um, and the third and final section is how to make recruitment more inclusive. So I've got some ideas on how to do that, some quick tips. So I've written them down. So disability awareness training, you know, I think is imperative about all of this stuff so that people start being educated and have knowledge about disability. Um, I've said before, not making assumptions about people, um, asking all applicants about adjustments right at the very outset, um, having knowledge about reasonable adjustments. And I'll give you a reference point, the ECHR, which stands for the Equality and Human Rights Commission guidance. You can check out their website. They have on their website, commonly accepted risk uh, sorry, reasonable adjustments um, on the website so you can have some examples of what those are. And remember, as recruiters, you are under a positive duty to make reasonable adjustments. Um, so that, that is, a, is a requirement. Um, another tip is, if on your website, you know, you want to be open about disability, 
firstly make it accessible that would help as well um, so so a, a person with visual impairment or hearing impairment can actually access the website um, but also maybe have a point of contact you know if you have a disability or you require an adjustment or you want to speak to someone about your disability impairment health condition you know use all that language because not everybody identifies as being disabled um, this is the person that you need to contact and give an individual name contact details because if i'm sharing very personal information about myself i don't know where this is going is it going to a generic email address who's disseminating this information i want a personal relationship with that person um, so that i can have these sensitive personal conversations with them so a good tip is to have a point of contact on there um, and be clear that you are willing to make adjustments as i said have that conversation from the outset um, be clued up about access to work which i mentioned before which is it's part of the government it's it's known as the best kept secret access to work is government funded um, they're very generous so when i went back to work for example i worked for a big international law firm they had the money but they could rely on access to work what did access to work do for me they paid about one thousand pounds towards my lightweight wheelchair they paid for taxis to and from the office because a lot of the underground is inaccessible i can't actually get on it um, which saved me a lot of bother they came into work and did a workplace assessment i looked at um, the different height of the desk they provided me with a keyboard you know these things are available for free from the government so th these are trying to remove the barriers for disabled people to get them into work without these um, barriers in place so be clued up about that. And lastly, I'll finish by this. Um, there's a lot of talk about job descriptions and how I think we're becoming quite lazy in the way that we just use the standard job descriptions and don't question it. I'll give you an example. So we could say something like, this person must have a, um, a clean driving license. When instead we could say, um, this job requires extensive travel around the UK. You see, why does that matter well if we're saying you must have a driving license if you're blind you can't drive that's fairly obvious right um but doesn't that disable that person from applying for the job if they if they know there's extensive travel well they can get around another way by train or um, some other mode of transport taxi or, or whatever and access to work could pay for that so you know a disabled person may carry out the task differently uh, but they, they, it's the same result. So the job description is very telling because it may, you know, that person may think, well, that's me out, whereas you've missed out on that talent. So it's just being aware of our language and thinking, who is this helping and, and, and who, who, who's barred from applying? So hopefully that helps, just a few tips at the end to make it more inclusive. That's really great, thank you. Um, I'm just, I think I've got to jump between the chat box here and the um, Q&A box, but I'll, I'll try and order these questions um, in, a, in a way that makes sense. But um, everyone is saying how, how they're loving the webinar, by the way. So lots oh, of- Oh, brilliant, thank you. Thank you. Um, we've had one question, which I think ties in somewhat to what you were just talking about, which is how accessible are generally recruitment agency websites in your experience? um i don't know actually as the honest answer and um, i know i mean that statistic that i read out um you know 1.3 million people can't uh, you know access website i think generally websites are quite poor i'm not entirely sure about the recruitment websites but it's it's worth looking at your own one and, and having i mean i've got to look at my own website to be honest it's terrible it's you know i i've got to have subtitles i've got to do the work i'm not saying I'm perfect, I need to put the work in and make it accessible for people. I have my own blind spots, just because I can see and hear doesn't mean that other people can, they need to access it in a different way. I don't know the answer to that, if I'm honest, about the statistics, but I bet, generally speaking, we're pretty poor at this. That would be my um, assumption from my experience as well, actually, Yasmin, and I think, um, some of it, as you mentioned earlier, is through lack of understanding, really, rather than an intentional um, 
um, bias. Yeah. Um, so we've got a few other questions here, and, and again, hopefully I can make these um, come in some sense. But we had one um, one of the uh, participants has been has commented on on your question around language. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'll just read you out what she's written. So we're, I'm interested in your point about language, in particular the question, do you work? In contrast to what do you do? I once asked a wheelchair user what they did. He was upset by my question and responded by saying that it was extremely ignorant to me to assume that he was able to work because of course I'm not able to go out and work like everybody else. Oh, gosh. I punched the situation better so as not to cause offense very difficult yeah that's really interesting so again what that just shows is not all disabled people think the same who would have thought you know yeah. we always think oh women think in a certain way we're not a homogenous group <laughs> you know not all black people see, see, think in the same way not all lgbt people think in the same way everybody is so different that the trouble is as a minority group you feel like you're speaking for a whole community. I'm not. I'm speaking for me, but these are, you know, generally speaking, um, I mean, if, if, again, I would take that as an individual and say, you know, just be gracious, say, I'm really sorry. Um, I, I, the intention was not to cause offence, and I completely take that on board. Thank you for telling me. We've got to put our ego aside. Whether or not we think, oh, bit touchy, but we don't know what's happened to that person. You know, so um, that's really interesting that he said that because actually he's perpetuating a stereotype that disabled people, why would you assume they do work? So I would think, okay, there's, he's coming from a different angle. But I respect that, that's his experience. He felt like that, you know, you can't take that away. But, you know, however people act, if they are, we've got to look at sometimes impact over intention. There's a lot of times I've put my foot in it, not intending to do it. But the impact has been that somebody may have said, actually, that language made me uncomfortable. Or, and you listen to the person, you learn from it, and you move on. That, yeah, that I think is good advice. It's a great bit of advice, actually, Yasmin. And, and I think you're absolutely right. You, people do respond differently. And as you said, you know, we can't put people in buckets. So I think the biggest point that you've probably given us all is just that awareness. And by having that awareness, hopefully we can show a bit of humility, as you say, and put the ego away and, and be a bit yeah. more human. Yeah. Um, and that, there's a few more questions, if you don't mind. So loving the webinar, uh, which organisations do you see as being industry leading around attracting disabled talent? Well, I work predominantly with law firms, so that's my experience. Um, and I know there's a firm, Reed Smith, we, we, we always talk about Reed Smith solicitors who are really the trailblazers, I think, when it comes to disability. Um, in terms of, you know, they've really made strides in, in recruiting disabled talent, changing the culture, having uh, open conversations, um, it's not just getting people in the door because a lot of the time people think, oh, it's, you know, it's the new intake. They're looking at, the, they're looking at this from a, from a point of view of how do we progress people as well? It's, the works never stops um, because, you know, what we see a lot of in the legal industry is a lot of women, for example, um, lots of women are entering the legal profession. But guess what? They drop off when it comes to leadership positions partner positions because there's unconscious bias there's barriers there so you know for me i can name reed smith and i can say in the legal industry that's who i see is very progressive on this because it's not just people looking at it in a, in a very narrow point of view just getting people in the door it's always thinking how does our workplace reflect society reflect our clients you know because a good workplace should actually have people from all different backgrounds all different kind of ways of thinking because that makes a much stronger team so that that's what i'd say to that question thank you um steve carter's just um, um message through to say to the audience check out www.recite.me.com which he says has is a great simple application to make websites accessible so oh, thank brilliant. you thank you First, thank you. So that's recite me 
Um, we've also had one of the panellists um, ask a specific question about a role that they've taken on um, as a disabilities officer at their university's law society. Would you be happy for that individual to contact you on LinkedIn, Yasmin? Yes, and, uh, you could possibly give them a bit of advice on how to be successful yes. in that role. I'll do um, my so best. Thank you. Please let connect with me on LinkedIn, Yasmin Sheikh. Very happy to help. Thank you. And then one um, final question that probably nicely wraps up um, is, again, somebody saying how much they share your passion for disability inclusion. And, and why do you think it's not had the same traction as other areas like gender, BAME, LGBT? I have lots of reasons. I think it's because we think about disability in a narrow framework, as in sticks and wheelchairs, as I said, we don't you know, I've done some work with, with a big law firm and we asked um, people in a survey, do you have a disability, yes or no? 1% identified with that label. We then asked, do you have a disability or long-term health condition? 25% identified with that label. So it's the way we frame the question and the way we think and identify about ourselves. Uh, there's something about the word disability or disabled that some people may not readily identify with a lot of people with cancer would not call themselves disabled i don't think even the hearing impaired deaf people a lot of people i know do, do not identify with that word disabled mental health conditions again so it's about sometimes how we talk about disability and the language we use and i think also why there isn't fully full engagement about disability is that we have these um, negative assumptions about disabled people and and it's, I think the language, the narrative that we see is more about helping charity. I mean, even during this COVID-19, have you noticed disabled people and vulnerable people are put into the same category, but just because you're disabled doesn't necessarily make you vulnerable. I prefer the word, you know, in terms of the virus, I'm probably more, well, I'm not actually any more susceptible to other people, but if you've got a lung condition or asthma or a condition whereby you are more susceptible, it doesn't, you know, I know people might think, oh, this is political correctness gone mad, but language really does matter. So I think language, identity, how we talk about disability, and also the, the truth is this, this is the uncomfortable truth is, we don't like to think about disability because it scares us. I think a lot of the time when people interact with me, they, you know, they may say things like, I don't know how you do it, I don't think I could do it, a lot of it is about ourselves. We think, how the hell can, how would I cope? How, how would, how would, when I told my story, people probably think, how would I do? I mean, I don't have a choice. I have to get on with it. But a lot of the time, it's, it, we're frightened. We're frightened of being ill or having something taken away from us. That is natural. What I had to experience was a loss, was a bereavement. Yes, I've gained in some other ways, and you know I've made um, my life as, as best as I can and you know I that period I look at it very differently now um, you know it was I also say it was the worst thing that happened to me but it was also the best thing that happened to me as well if that makes sense it can be both um, and I think people are just frightened of feeling vulnerable feeling um, they don't want to think about this but the truth is you know if you stick around long enough you will become a member of the disability club because at some point our bodies and our mind and our senses will change we're working for longer we're an aging population so it's a reality that comes to us but we don't want to think about it just right now and we do live in an ableist society where you know we value health uh you know what we look like all of those things all of those things are going on in our heads but we don't like to think about this other stuff that's yeah, a very long answer. I think it's a great answer, but it's very honest as well. Um, and I think you're right. It's a topic that, yeah, I guess it, it does frighten a lot of people probably. So thank you. Yasmin, I mean, you've been incredibly honest with us. So thank you for, for that. It's really important. And that, I think that's perhaps one thing that COVID has, again, has brought out in a lot of people is this more human element to, to us all. And, um, you know, that's been hopefully one of the things we'll take forward and continue with. Um, but you're also about to go and become a mum, aren't you, in the next few I am. Not so long to go. 
exciting. So another um, factor. I, yeah, I know. Well, there we go. Life's going to change again. I know. <laughs> that will put you to the test. But um, no, that's that's really exciting. And congratulations Thank on that. You. I Thank hope that goes well and you enjoy motherhood. And I thank you so very much for sharing with us your story, your tips, your advice. Um, and if people would like to connect with you, you're happy then that they connect Absolutely. with you. Yeah, find me on LinkedIn. That's probably the best place or Twitter at Diverse Matters. But LinkedIn, I'm very active on that. So uh, that person who wanted to get in touch, send me a private message on that and we'll pick it up. Great. Thank you for your kindness, your honesty. Good luck over the next few weeks. And thank you. Um, all the audience are coming in as well saying thank you very, very much. Thank you, everyone. A great weekend. We'll see everybody next week when we're joined with Tara Ricks, who will be coming to talk to us about her lessons for leaders as we navigate through a new reality. So we will see you again next Friday. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.